Hello friends. In this particular session, this is the second session in the DC machine module. We will be starting with the concept of Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction and I will also be covering the concept of the cross product of vectors which is very important in finding the direction of the induced EMF. So let's start with Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction because it's a it's the fundamental principle governing the DC machines, uh, in particular the DC generators. Okay. Now, the DC generators, or in, for matter, as a matter of fact, any generator, the working is highly credited to the work of Michael Faraday, who introduced this law of electromagnetic induction. So, to begin with, let us look at the statement. So, this is the statement of the Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction, which I will read it out for you. Whenever there is a changing magnetic flux and it's acting on a conductor, an EMF is induced and this EMF is proportional to the rate of change of flux. I know in many uh, areas where people teach, they just tell that the Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction, uh, the statement they give it as an EMF is induced in a conductor when there is a changing magnetic flux which acts on it and the, the amount of induced EMF is proportional to the changing flux. Well, that is not true uh, and in fact that is inaccurate also. That's why I have put this statement in bold. The amount of EMF induced is proportional to the rate of change of flux. So it depends whether the, uh, the flux is increasing or it is decreasing at a particular direction in some point of time. Actually in DC generators, this concept is not uh, very much used. But however, when you are understanding the working of transformers, this rate of change flux uh, concept comes in very much handy. All right, so what does this statement mean? So for that, let us introduce some simple terms here, which the term here, flux is important. So what is a flux? The flux is the amount of magnetic field. It is the amount of magnetic field around a magnet, all right? which is represented as magnetic lines of force, which is represented as magnetic lines of force. So what does this mean actually? So let us take a simple drawing here. For example, we are having a magnet and this drawing you might have seen in countless textbooks right from your uh, school and to your college. So when you are having north and south, you know this, there are flux lines like this, all right? So these are the, this is the magnetic field which is created by the flux and the flux always moves from the north to south, that is the convention. So the flux is actually the amount of magnetic field lines, okay, it's like a number, it is the total amount of magnetic field lines which is around a magnet and it is represented as the magnetic lines of force, therefore it will have a unit. So what is the unit of flux? The unit of flux is Weber, the SI unit of flux is Weber and it is usually represented by the letter phi. So phi is the representation of flux, whereas Weber is the uh, unit of the flux. The next term is the flux linkage. It is the flux linkage. So what is the flux linkage? It is the extent of interaction. It is the extent of interaction between the flux and the conductor, all right? This is represented by the letter lambda and it usually depends amount of, uh, it usually depends on the number of conductors which are involved. Therefore, if you are having the number of conductors to be n and it is in a flux field of phi, you will have an interaction which is equal to n phi. So usually phi is equal to n into phi where n is the number of uh, conductors which are involved, okay? Now, all is well and good, you are having induced EMF, okay? Now, clearly, according to Faraday's laws, according to Faraday's laws, you need three things to get EMF. One is a conductor, okay? Next is a magnetic field. And third one is a relative motion. It's a relative motion between the conductor 
and the magnetic field. Okay, that is how you get the rate of change of flux. So, you have a conductor, you have a magnetic field, and you have a relative motion between the conductor and magnetic field. And once these three, these three conditions are fulfilled, you are going to get an EMF induced in your conductor. Now, based on who is moving and who is not, because the term is relative motion, so it can be the conductor which is moving and the magnetic field is stationary, or it can be the magnetic field which is moving or the conductor is stationary. Now, depending upon who is moving, you are having two types of induced EMFs. So the induced EMF can be divided into two. One is the statically induced EMF, statically induced EMF, and both of these EMF are in the perspective of the conductor. And the next one is the dynamically induced EMF. Dynamically induced EMF. All right. Now, what is a statically induced EMF? A statically induced EMF is an EMF in which the conductor is stationary and the field is changing. Okay. So, here the conductor is stationary. And the field is having the movement. What is the dynamically induced EMF? The dynamically induced EMF, as you can clearly guess now, the conductor is the movement, conductor has the movement, and the field is the stationary. Okay. So usually in statically induced EMF, you are having the example of transformers, all right, and uh, your DC generators etc. come under the dynamically induced EMF. So with this, let us summarize what are the modes of producing induced EMF. So there are three modes, if I can summarize it like that. The first one is the conductor which is rotating. The conductor rotates, the flux is stationary, and the second mode is the conductor is stationary. And the flux is rotating and the third mode is that the conductor is stationary and the flux is a time varying quantity. See I have told you already for Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction to come into play you need a varying flux. So that can be a variation as seen by the conductor right. So the conductor can move and the flux is stationary, the conductor sees a change in flux, or the conductor is stationary and the flux is rotating around it, it the conductor again sees a change in flux, or the conductor is stationary and the flux is not a constant value, but it is a changing value, it's an AC quantity. In that case also you are having going, you are going to have an induced DMF. So let's see what kind of machines follow all these modes. So when the conductor rotates and flux is stationary, usually it is your DC generator and small AC machines small AC generators, which are uh, rated to a very small value. In case you are you look into your labs in colleges, you can see the synchronous generator which they use, which will have usually the flux is stationary. So the next point, the conductor is stationary and the flux is rotating. Usually in this, this is used in AC generators of high capacity. That is a topic of another discussion. And the third point, the conductor is stationary and the flux is a time varying quantity and that is the transformers. So I hope you have understood the concept of Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction as far as DC generators is concerned because Faraday's laws itself is a quite a big topic and uh, we are just going to uh, go through those areas in which DC machines are going to get involved. So with this, let me uh, conclude the dis discussion on the Faraday's laws and let us take another important topic which is called the cross product. The cross product of vectors because that is going to be used in this particular discussion. So all of you might be aware of cross product of vectors. You are having two types of operation on vectors which is the dot product and the cross product. For example, you are having a vector C which is represented by the cross product of two vectors A cross B. Now. You know that the magnitude of C will be equal to AB into sin theta, which is the definition for cross product of vectors. Now, because it's a vector, it has a magnitude and it has a direction. So this is this part takes care of the magnitude and the direction of C 
the direction of C is equal to the direction of A cross B. So what is the direction of A cross B here? That you have to understand using a simple drawing so that you make a small cube-like structure here. Okay, so it's a three-dimensional structure. I'm putting it in 2D. So you have to understand that this angle is 90 degree. This angle is also 90 degree. And if I put the internal structure of the cube also, so this particular angle also is going to be 90 degree. Okay, so let us have two vectors here. We'll take a different color. So, so this vector is A. This vector is A. And this vector is B. So I have told you in this particular example, the direction of C is the direction of A cross B. So how do we get the direction of A cross B? For that you would understand that the direction of A cross B, direction of A cross B, which is also equal to the direction of C, will be perpendicular to both vector A and vector B. Okay. So vector A is like this in the vertical direction and vector B is in the horizontal direction like this. So which is the plane which is perpendicular to both? That is this line here, right? So anything which is here is perpendicular to both A and B, okay? So it will your vector C will be either here or here. So we have to find whether it is in this direction or it is in this direction. And that is where the right hand screw rule comes into play. So what does the right hand screw rule tell us? So A cross B means you take the vector A, you take the vector A here and you rotate it in the shortest path available. Why it is the shortest path? You are having two paths to rotate. See, if you want to try to bring A to B, you can either go like this in the clockwise direction or you can go in the counterclockwise direction. But as per the convention, you have to move in the shortest path available. So shortest path here is the clockwise direction. And if I move a screw in the clockwise direction, it will go inward. A right hand screw, if you move in the clockwise direction, it will go inward. Therefore, in this case, I'm moving it in this particular direction. The screw will be going like this. So that will be the direction of the vector C. So this will be the direction of the vector C. <clears throat> now, you cannot always draw cubes to explain all these concepts, right? So you have to understand the concept of the representation of the vector going inside the paper or the vector coming outside the paper. So the same diagram, let me put it in 2D properly. So this is your vector A and this is your vector B. Now a, a particular line which is perpendicular to both A and B will be either going inside the paper or it will be coming outside the paper. Okay. Now because your vector is represented by an arrow which is looking like this, if you look at a vector from here, it is going away from you. This vector is like going away from you. If you look from this point, what you will be seeing is this particular cross here. Because your arrow has a structure like this. What you will be seeing is these two particular lines here. Okay. And if you view it from here, you will be seeing the tip of the uh, arrow. So you will be seeing a dot. So when the vector is coming towards you, so when a paper is concerned, when the vector is coming out of the paper, you will be seeing the head of the vector, right? You are, you are seeing the head of the vector. So it will be represented as a dot. If the vector is going inside the paper, you will be seeing the back of the vector. So you will be seeing this particular portion here, this particular portion. So you will be representing it by a cross. So let us see whether our vector C has a cross or a dot. So A cross B, I am going to take A and I'm rotating it towards B. So I'm moving in the clockwise direction. In the clockwise direction, your screw will go into the paper, right? So the screw is going to go into the paper like this. I cannot show it here because it's a two dimensional diagram. So because it is going inside the paper, you will be seeing the back of the vector. So you will be seeing like this, and this will be the direction of C, okay? So let us take a few examples here to clear the concept. So the first one I have already done here. So this is your vector A, vector B, and the vector C will be like this. So when C is equal to A cross B, this is the condition. Now let's take the same vectors, A, B. 
to the first condition and the second condition I am defining C to be B cross A. I am defining C to be B cross A. So what do you do? You take your vector B and you move it towards A in the shortest direction. So this is a long direction. The clockwise direction now becomes the long direction. But this is the shortest direction, the anti-clockwise. So when you move the screw in the anti-clockwise direction, the screw will come outside the paper. So what you will be seeing? You will be seeing the vector head. So when you see the vector head, you are going to see the point. So in this case, this will be the direction of vector C. Now, let us take a third case here. In the third case, I am again defining C to be A cross B. But now, I am just going to put vector A here. And I am going to put vector B here. <coughs> so, A cross B, take vector A and move to B in the shortest direction. Anti-clockwise direction, the screw is coming out. So, vector C will have this particular direction. And as a final case, this is my vector A. And this is my vector B. And C, I am going to put it as B cross A in this case. So you take your vector B and you move it to vector A in the shortest direction and because it is a clockwise, the screw will go into the paper. So you will see the back side of the vector. So here you are going to see the cross. Okay. Now why I am explaining all these things you might wonder because these, usually these topics come into mechanical engineering, cross product and uh, sign pro this cross product and all. Why I am explaining is this because the induced EMF, the induced EMF is proportional to the direction of V cross B. Okay? V is the velocity, relative velocity of the conductor with respect to the field and the force acting on a conductor is proportional to I cross B. Now to find the direction of induced EMF and the force, you are having the right hand rule and the left hand rule. But the problem is that you cannot always use your fingers to do all this. It's very cumbersome. But if you remember this particular technique, you will be able to find the uh, directions of induced EMF and uh, direction of the force which is generated in a fraction of a second. So I hope you have understood the concept of cross products here. And in the next lecture, we will be starting with the DC generation part. How is DC generated? So I hope you have enjoyed this particular session. Please like, share and subscribe this uh, channel. Uh, for more videos like this and I wish you all the best.